Hi guys, welcome to Biochemistry and Cell Biology and in this presentation I'll be covering proteins and amino acids. So the learning objectives for this presentation are to know that proteins are made up of amino acids, to know the generic structure of an amino acid and be able to identify the different functional groups as well as the central carbon, to understand that amino acid side chains have different properties, to be able to define primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure, to recall the types of bonding that stabilize the different protein structures, to know and describe the secondary structures, and to know why protein and cysteine are special amino acids in terms of their effects on protein structure. So first of all, what is an amino acid? Well, amino acid is a molecule which consists of four different groups, and the groups they consist of is a carboxyl group, an amino group, an R group, and a hydrogen group, or hydrogen atom. So here is just a basic diagram of an amino acid. So as we can see here, this here is the alpha carbon, which is the central carbon. And attached to it, we've got the carboxyl group. Over here, we've got the amino group. Here, we've got the hydrogen atom. And here, we've got the R group. But in reality, amino acids don't actually exist like this. OK, so do not draw something like this. In reality, they exist something like this. So as you can see, there is a very, very subtle difference. On the, on the carboxyl group on this drawing here, we see that we've still got the hydrogen attached to it. Well, in reality, they're actually dissolved in water. So in the water, we know that acids will dissociate. So that hydrogen will leave the oxygen to leave us with the carboxyl ion on this side. That hydrogen will then bond to this amino group here, forming an NH3 group. And this here is what's called a Zwitter ion, meaning that the hydrogen is transferred from the carboxyl group to the amino group. So next of all, what is a protein? Well, a protein is a long sequence of amino acids joined together by peptide bonds. And this here is just a general diagram of how you'll see some proteins represented as. So let's just go right back to basics again. So there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. We've got the hydrophobic groups, which include glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, proline, and cysteine. Okay, so these two amino acids are really um, unique in terms of what they do to the protein. And I'll cover them in a minute. You've also got the hydrophobic aromatic amino acids, which are these. So you've got phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So you can see how the different structures can give them different um, qualities. And also we've got the hydrophilic amino acids. So notice with these amino acids, they're hydrophilic and also they can have different properties. So if you look at this one, here you'd see that there's a carboxyl group. Same for here. So these ones you could call are acidic. And these ones with the amino groups on the end, they would act as basics. So even just these slight differences on the amino acids, you can they'll have a broad range of different qualities and abilities. So starting off with the primary structure, so this is when amino acids join together to form poly polypeptides. So here we've got one amino acid, and here we've got another amino acid. When these two come together, this OH here and this H here will bond together to form water. And the remaining, this thing here, is a dipeptide, so it's a combination of two amino acids. So if you were to define the primary structure, it would be the linear sequence of amino acids joined together by peptide bonds. So let's think of these as metal chains. So each of these rings are representing an individual amino acid. So as you can see, it starts off going in a straight line, but as you get longer and longer, it tends to turn inwards. Okay, so this is going to lead me on to the next part, which is about the secondary structure. So here we've got the secondary structure, and the secondary structure tends to come in two different shapes, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. So here on the left we've got an alpha helix. So as you can see, it's helical in shape. But one thing to remember is that for each turn of the helix, every time you'll find only 3.6 amino acid residues per turn. Okay, And an easy way to remember that is that each residue will turn the helix 100 degrees. And we know that there's 360 degrees in a circle, so it's just basic math to figure out the 3.6. And between each of these layers of the alpha helis, we've got hydrogen bonds between oxygen and hydrogens. Same thing happens in the beta pleated sheets. So the amino acids will be going in different directions depending on whether you're anti-parallel or parallel. So this is anti-parallel and this is parallel. So they'll go across, and between these sheets is where you'll get the hydrogen bonds. Okay, so if you were to define the secondary structure, it's the regular folding of regions of the polypeptide chain. So as I said, here's, you, here's just a little, now, a little way to remember hydrogen bonds. So it's just going from 
the hydrogen to, a, to an electronegative atom, usually an oxygen in our cases. It, although these bonds aren't particularly strong, because of the sheer number that you get in a protein, it actually becomes quite strong. So if you think of it as a shower mat, when you've got one of those sucker things on the, on the, on the shower, it's not really strong. But because of how many there are, it can actually be quite difficult to move it. Okay, so now I'm just going to give you a reason why proline is an exception. So proline is not usually found in alpha helices as the size and the shape of the R group will disturb the number of coils, which is also called the Ramachandra and Pollock, if you want to have a little look at that. But you can locate this at the beginning and end of an alpha helix. Okay, so as we can see here, this here is the central carbon, and this is the R group here. And if you notice something, the R group connects to the amino group. This means that instead of turning the alpha helix 100 degrees, it will turn it a different amount. And I'll suggest you read up on that and how on how it does that. So the next step from secondary is tertiary. So the tertiary structure is the 3D arrangement of all the amino acids in the polypeptide chain. And in the tertiary structure, you get all sorts of bonds forming. You get hydrogen bonds between, between oxygen and hydrogen. You can get hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals forces between molecules. You can also get ionic bonds between like the amine group and the, and the oxygen. And also this is where cysteine comes in. So cysteine is in a unique amino acid because at the end of the R group, you've got sulfur. And what this allows to do is form a disulfide bridge in which you get a covalent interaction between one sulfur on one cysteine residue and a sulfur on another, forming this link here. So after tertiary, you then get quaternary. So the quaternary structure is formed by the interaction of different polypeptide chains, which are also called subunits. So each of these colored chains here represents a different polypeptide chain. So these two blue ones are the same, and these two red ones are the same. So this here is a, is a diagram of hemoglobin, consisting of two alphas and two betas. And if you also notice, these groups here, okay, these are known as prosthetic groups. They're inorganic molecules which have been attached on, which will, which will give the protein a different function. So in this case, we've got heme. Okay, moving on, you can get different types of proteins. You can get structurals, hormone, immunity, transport, enzyme, receptor, contractile, and storage proteins. So to begin with, with structural protein, an example could be like keratin, collagen, and elastin. So structural proteins are used for, for giving structure and support to other cells and tissues. And, in, and in, if you to look at them in terms of structure, they're all fibrillar. So you can find this in hair, in your nails, on your skin, etc. places like that. Then the next one is a hormone. So this here is six residues of insulin. So insulin can act as a chemical signal, hormones can have a wide variety of functions. You can also get immunity proteins. So the most common immunity protein we have is immunoglobin, which are your basic antibodies. And in a normal human being, you get five different types. You get immunoglobin A, immunoglobin D, E, G, and M. As you can see, they are globular in shape. You can also get transport proteins. A really, again, the example I'm going to use here is hemoglobin, as oxygen will bind to the heme groups. Therefore, it can then get transported around the body, and it's also globular in shape. Then for enzymes, if we use amylase as an example, it's a protein and it's globular in shape. Then if you think of receptor proteins, so these are the things that you find on the cell surface membrane, which receive signals and cause particular function. So this here is an insulin receptor. So insulin will bind and then a signal will be sent towards the middle of the cell telling you that insulin has been detected. And as you can see, it's globular in shape. Then for contractile proteins, here you've got the myosin heads. So myosin and actin are the two main contractile proteins as we know from the sliding filament theory. And they are globular at the ends, but as you go down the middle, they become fibrillar. And for the final one, we've got transport proteins. So this one here is called ferritin. So this here, you'll have iron binding in the middle of the ferritin molecule, and then you can transport it to places for heme. And as you can see, it's globular in shape. So we've already come to the end of the presentation. So just a few things that you need to do that will help you with this. If you create a table, and I want you to include these columns, so type of protein, an example of the protein, the function of that protein, the secondary structures, so whether they are alpha helices or beta pleated sheets, and diseases that can be caused if you've got a lack of them or without of them. Okay, so 
Here's the test yourself section. I'm going to give you a question. I'm not going to give you the mark scheme. So let's see what answers you come up with. So, first of all, how many amino acid residues are there per turn of an alpha helix for one mark? For two marks, draw and outline the basic structure of an amino acid. For six marks, describe the structure of a tertiary protein and explain how all the different types of bonding in it allow it to be stable. Then finally, an essay style question for 25 marks. What are the different types of proteins, given examples, and describe examples of disease that can be caused as a result of a faulty protein or a lack of protein. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope it's helped for your revision purposes. And good luck revising. Peace.